Graves Jr., CEO of Black Enterprise. Thanks for joining me for an all new episode of From the Corner Office. For the past several months, crises and uncertainty have engulfed corporate America. The public health and economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and racial reckoning in response to police brutality and discriminatory practices, among other developments, have not only challenged major companies, but served to redefine corporate leadership. No one better represents CEOs who have the mix of composure, compassion, and vision needed during these chaotic times than Marvin Ellison, president and CEO of Lowe's Corp, the $71 billion home improvement retailer with more than 1,700 stores and roughly 300,000 employees. Let me share a bit of Marvin's background. This son of Brownsville, Tennessee sharecroppers ignited his three decade career in retail when he took a job as a store security guard at Target for $4.35 an hour to pay for college. He went on to earn a business administration degree in marketing from the University of Memphis and an MBA from Emory University. Marvin then spent 15 years working his way up the ranks at Target before heading to the Home Depot for a 12 year stint that resulted in his rise to executive vice president of US stores with responsibility for more than 700 stores and 150,000 associates. His management prowess would eventually lead him to the position of CEO of J.C. Penney in 2015, and his decisive moves to turn around the legacy retailer resulted in store upgrades, enhanced merchandise and services, and a significant boost in shareholder value. Due to his restoration of the J.C. Penney brand, Black Enterprise named him our 2016 Corporate Executive of the Year. By 2018, Marvin decided to take the helm of Lowe's, his quote, once in a lifetime job. Under his watch, he invested in technology that expanded in the e-commerce business and increased the number of small business and DIY customers compared to rival retailers. As the pandemic struck, he remained true to his mantra of faith, family, and company. In fact, Lowe's is committed a total of nearly $775 million this year to aid associates and communities. Moreover, he has placed a special emphasis on small and minority businesses, providing $55 million in grants for such enterprises. And he recently partnered with Damon John of Shark Tank to create a pitch competition, Making It With Lowe's, to help minority vendors place their products on Lowe's shelves. Marvin, thank you for joining me today. A pleasure, Butch. It's a pleasure to have you, Marvin. And, um, you know, before we get started into some of the other things, I, I, I think it would be helpful for people to get a little bit of your background and your story on how you even got into the retail business. It's fascinating in a lot of different ways, but how you spent your career in it and how you got into it in the first place from your very humble beginnings and you've maintained that humbleness all throughout. Well, well, thanks, Butch. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, as, as, as you, you know, in a very articulate fashion laid out, I mean, I started out uh, basically in the, the lowest position, you know, in any retail, and that's a part-time employee, you know, working as a store security officer. And to be quite candid, you know, I'm a student at the University of Memphis. Back then it was called Memphis State. Uh, I needed a job to help pay for books. Uh, and, and, and pay the rent. And I went to the employment office at the university and I walked in in a very strategic way and said, you know, to the clerk at the desk, what's the highest paying part-time job you have posted on the board? And she <laughs> said, there's this security job at Target. I said, I'll take it. And that's how strategic my, my retail <laughs> career <laughs> was. And so I started out, but I was, you know, I was kind of intuitive enough to know when I started at Target that I was working for a company that, that had something special happening. And so I spent 15 years there and I learned as, as much as I could about retail and I had the opportunity to join the Home Depot. And, and, and part of my journey and part of my growth in retail has just, just the intellectual curiosity to learn more and to gain as much knowledge about as many parts of the store as I could, but also to never allow the head of HR or my HR partner or my supervisor 
to take responsibility for my career. I've always felt that you have to own your own career and, and take that own take that responsibility you know, on yourself to map out where you want to go next. And I was just very blessed and very fortunate that that my career started out with two world class companies, Target and then the Home Depot. And as I you know worked my way you know through the different jobs at the Home Depot from you know, you know, loss prevention to supply chain, uh, to store operations, to being a division president, ultimately being over all the stores, I had an opportunity to, to be viewed as, as one of the two or three people to be considered, you know, to replace the outgoing CEO. It didn't work out in, in my favor, but I ended up, you know, taking on that turnaround situation at, at JCPenney, which for me, uh, was a blessing in disguise because it, it taught me things that I couldn't learn in business school about the management of a company in crisis. I understood and had to learn quickly the debt markets, you know, capital structure in a much more, you know, finite way. Uh, and, and also having worked for two, you know, companies with great balance sheets, I had to come into a company uh, there was a little bit of, of turmoil and figure out the adjustments in how you create a better, more efficient balance sheet and shareholder value. And I wouldn't trade the people I met and the lessons I learned for anything. And then, as you said, I was blessed with the opportunity to come, you know, to take over the opportunity here at Lowe's. And I've been here now for a little over two years and I couldn't be more proud of the progress that we're making as a company. That's a fascinating story, uh, Marvin, and it's testimony to you know, uh, you know, as my father say would say, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? Yeah. And, and taking taking command of your career and not letting someone else, you know, define for you where you necessarily should go. Uh, would love to unpack a little bit about the retail industry as a whole, because frankly, no industry that I can think of maybe save the airline industry has been more challenged and not just challenged uh, post COVID-19, but was challenged even prior to that. I mean, yeah. you certainly saw that in going over to, to JC Penney and others, but we'd love to talk a little bit about what has changed in the retail industry. And if you go back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago, right? And that pace of change, uh, and what what is different about the retail industry uh, now than was then? I mean, obviously, the the rise of digital has played a big part in that. Sure. Uh, but how do you how does one navigate now the retail industry compared to what you had to do? You know, if you can think back ten years ago, twenty years, you didn't have to think about. There was no internet to think about, right? There was no, you know, any of that. What has changed in the industry? And then I guess you can speak a little bit about. What is Lowe's doing now today, right? Sort of post COVID nineteen, to make a difference in people's lives. Yeah, I, I think, Butch, the the largest change is that customer expectations and customer preferences have changed over the last ten years. I mean, you know, I grew up, as you said, in this little small two stoplight town in Brownsville, Tennessee, uh, and and I couldn't get access to certain brands or products if I could afford them because there was no retailer in, in my trade area that I could go in and, and buy certain goods. But today, you know, when I go out to, to my dad's house, he still lives in the same house I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I can go online and I can get access to any goods or services that exist anywhere in the marketplace with just a few clicks. And, and, and so it's, it's elevated consumer preferences and consumer expectations. And, and, and that elevation now is driven an expectation of customers that all retailers have to meet a certain threshold of service and access. And, and retailers that don't have the, the capital structure and the investment thesis to make those things come to life for customers are gonna fall behind. And, and typically when you look at any retailer, you know, within, you know, the last five years, and you said it very well, even pre-COVID, you could see the landscape starting to shift. And COVID has only accelerated that change in a more dramatic fashion. So for, for, for us at Lowe's, 
that the thing that, that we're trying to do is we're trying to, to just really play catch up. We're in a re really unique position. So first and foremost, we were really behind from a technology standpoint. I'm talking about not only just basic IT infrastructure, but if you think about just Lowe's.com, our online business, we're operating on a decade old platform, a decade old platform. Now I remind anyone, just think about your computer 10 years ago versus your computer today. And, and, and that is the difference between the platform that we were operating on versus other world-class retailers like a Target or Walmart or Costco. And, and, and so we worked very hard to replatform the entire site to the cloud and, and create the agility and the functionality that customers just expect of anyone when they go online. In addition to that, you know, we've made all other types of investments in our mobile app and mobile technology in the store because at the end of the day, the greatest change is that customers have very little patience for anything that prevents them from consummating any transaction they want. If a customer wants to come in and shop the old fashioned way, get a shopping cart, put it in a basket and check out, they want zero friction points. They want it on the shelf, easy to find. They want to be able to check out quickly and, and go home. If they want to buy it online, have it shipped to their house, they want as few clicks as possible. If they want to buy it online and pick it up in the store, they want as, as few friction points as they possibly can to get the product. And, and so part of what we have to do at Lowe's and other retailers is minimize those friction points so that we can just create a, a great convenience for customers to shop any way they choose. And any retailer that's not doing that effectively is going to fall behind. And, and, and COVID, COVID just exacerbated that in, in such an incredible way. Right. Just as an example, in the first quarter, our online business grew, you know, let's go back to last year. So last year overall, our online business grew, give or take about less than 10%. In the second quarter of this year, our online business grew 135%. <laughs> right. And that's on a base of roughly $2 billion. So, so that's not a small, that's a big growth on a, a relatively large base. And, and so that tells you how COVID just drove, you know, an exponential shift of customers shopping online because, you know, it's touchless and, and they wanted to have that as a convenience. I can go on and on and on, but I think that's kind of gives you a, a, good, a good view of the landscape right now. No question. And, and, and I'll say this both as a customer and as a shareholder, um, you guys, Lowe's has, has navigated the omni-channel uh, experience in a great way. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of retailers, let's face it, uh, were challenged by what was happening with Amazon, right? Yeah. You know, Amazon forced the hand of retailers, you know, pre-COVID. And this, is, this had nothing to do with, I mean, COVID exacerbated the situation, but they, 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 they forced the hand of retailers that, Who's going to survive is those who can do it well in an omni-channel environment. And you guys have really done a, an excellent job. But and, and I guess it's at the end of the day, as you said, it's meeting your customers where your cust what your customers want, right? Absolutely. You know, when I speak, I, I have four, you know, uh, children, not children, they're they're young adults, right? But millennials. And I, when I watch this, sort of like it's having an in-house focus group, but when I watch how they operate their expectations of the frictionless thing that you talked about is a non-negotiable as far as they're concerned. And so in meeting that, that's what you're really having to meet. You're having to meet the customer the customer who says, listen, if I want to happen to walk, walk into your store today, great. But if I just want to just point and click and have it to pick up at the store, also great. Or if I want it delivered to me by tomorrow or two days from now, I expect to be able the same thing to be able to happen and do it, and you ask you to know my name as I walk through the door. That's right. Uh, at the same time, right? I want to be able to go through all of that. So, kudos to what you guys have done, and 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 being able to navigate and and make the adjustments in this COVID nineteen pandemic that is that may actually change. I'd be interested in getting your point of view, but I don't know that retail will go back to quote the what it was. You know what I mean? And I think that maybe this is the way upon which it will, I mean, more people will go back into stores, but it may never return back to the way it was, you know, back in February of 2020, if you will. No, but I, I agree with that. I, I, think, I think a couple of, there've been a couple of 
tipping points that I don't think we ever revert back to. I agree with you. I think digital commerce is only going to continue to grow. And so retailers have to have a very efficient digital platform. But I think the advantage that, that traditional brick and mortar retailers like a Lowe's can have in the future is how do you leverage your physical store locations to be a part of your infrastructure? H how do you make those, those assets an advantage to serve the customer and not a legacy disadvantage? Because you and I both know you could just go back five years or so and you had a, a lot of futurists and a lot of e-commerce writing the obituaries of brick and mortar retail because they felt like that at some point everybody would want to shop online. But, but, but I have a different thesis. I think that if we can leverage our physical locations in a way to drive customer convenience and, and meet those customers heightened expectations around serving them, then you can make these physical stores connected to a digital platform and advantage. And that's that whole omni-channel, you know, term that, that you and I hear all the time. And it's something that we talk about in, internally, but, but I think where customers have now transitioned to a, a more digital transaction as the starting point, I don't know that we ever revert back to where we were pre COVID. I think we revert back to some degree, but, but I think we're in a whole new territory that's going to be here for a while. And, and I also think, that you know, customers are going to be looking increasingly for the convenience factor of shopping so that they can limit their interaction and, and, and really you know, save their time to not have to you know, do things that just take away you know, from their general day. And, and I think that's all part of, of this whole new COVID world that we're living in has exacerbated that. And I don't know that we go back to where we were you know, pre-COVID. Excellent point. Excellent point. Let me let me pivot if I can for a moment. Sure. And, I, and you know, this is the, the fine line that you know corporate America finds itself in now. This is, as far as I see, there were two pandemics that took place. One was the pandemic of COVID nineteen. The other was the pandemic of racism that sort of reared its ugly head um, through. You know, it's not it's not just George Floyd. It's a, a number of different incidents that created this social unrest. But would love to get your perspective on how corporate America, and maybe more specifically Lowe's, has been able to navigate through this turbulent times, right? Unprecedented times that we've seen, uh, again, both for dealing with health and the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah. but also this pandemic, of because you have a large population of associates who are people of color, African American that look just like you and I, um, and what their expectation has been, how they expected the corporation to respond to them and and respond to this crisis, but at the same time recognizing, which I which I clearly recognize, you can't alienate all your customers, right? You can't alienate a portion of your customers. You have to find the fine line to demonstrate that yes, Black Lives Matter, but at the same time. I don't want to alienate everybody, you know, not everybody, but a large portion of our customer base. But I do need to show to our associates, we care about them, right? Tell me a little bit about how you guys are doing it and, and what has been the impact of this sort of social unrest. No, you, Butch, it's been, it's, it's been you know, one of the most challenging years of my life, and I'm sure yours, in, in a lot of respects. I mean, COVID on one side of it, but then all the social unrest that we've been dealing with, you know, has, has just been just mentally and physically fatiguing, you know, that we continue to deal with, you know, one incident after the other. So we, we've tried to do a couple of things here. And, and obviously, you know, I have a unique perspective, just like you as a, as a black man growing up in America, you know, raising a black son, uh, you know, I have a unique perspective. And the thing that we tried to do here uh, with, with our over 300,000 employees, is we've tried to make it safe to have uncomfortable conversations. Because I'm a big believer that if, if we can get in a room and, and we can, you know, take down, you know, our ability to be quickly and easily offended, and we can just talk about the issues, 
we can solve a lot of our problems internally. And what I've said consistently when people have asked me, do you want to go here and speak? We want you to go and speak to this group, that group, and you want to make a statement. I've said that there are really two groups that I'm trying to influence because there are two groups that I'm responsible for. So first, as the president and CEO, I'm obviously responsible for the 300,000 men and women that work for this company. And because I am the president and CEO, it's my responsibility to chart the course of this company's culture and policies that we're going to implement that's going to support that culture. And we have a culture where we will not tolerate discrimination, racism, or anything you know, similar to that under no circumstances. And so that's, that's a great statement, but what, our, what are our practices, what's our training programs, what's our policies to support you know, that cultural underpinning? And so part of what I've been doing is spending a lot of time doing town halls, we're doing a lot of time, you know, having smaller groups of discussions where we had talked about issues facing our country and, and, and giving them the perspective of a person who's president and CEO who happens to be a black man. And I can tell people stories that they don't believe because they think that those things don't happen to you because of your title. But you and I both know it has nothing to do with it. So having those conversations and then creating training programs where we have mandated that every leader will gather their team together and we've given them an outline and a structure on how to have these conversations to allow people to voice their concerns, but allow people to discuss, you know, how everything that's happening is impacting them as an individual, but also allowing people to educate each other about their, the lens that they are seeing things through in their vantage point. Because I think part of our issue is we expect everyone to see every issue like we see it, and that's just not practical. So making it comfortable to have uncomfortable conversations. And that's something that we are doing on an ongoing basis. The other thing we're trying to do is as a big company, you know, what can we do to be a role model in the community? And you talked about the $55 million in small business grants, primarily to, to minority, you know, small businesses, because you and I both know that the greatest devastation in this pandemic are small businesses, primarily minority-owned small businesses. And so as a company, we're just trying to do good and we're trying to be a good corporate citizen. And that was one of the things that we decided to do in addition to making sure that we're taking care of our own most vulnerable employees, and that's our hourly employees. And we've given you know, roughly $650 million in special bonuses to that, to that group of individuals. And so supporting the community, you know, providing, you know, the, the level of support needed to support the community financially, but also making sure that we're training our associates. So that's job one for me. Job number two is I got to be a good father and I got to teach and educate my children who, who are also young millennials on how they navigate in this world and how they make decisions, how they have conversations with their coworkers, classmates, and, and, and discuss this in, in a way that's not always confrontational, but in a way that we can educate and we can get toward a solution. Right. And the thing that, that I've challenged people to do in corporate America, you know, leaders like myself is talk less and do more. We, we just have to, our actions should speak louder than our words. There are way too many press releases and way too many headlines out there, but we need action. We need companies and leaders to step up and, and put things in action that, that they can, can deliver upon. And there are great companies out there with a lot of resources, much greater than resources at Lowe's, that, that the way we change this is we change it from the top and, our, and these companies need to step in and continue because we have some that are doing an incredible job that I look at and, and I marvel at, but we need companies to step up and let's take the right action so that we can drive change. No question. You know, one of the things that's been a, somewhat of a disappointment to me, as I as I sit here and I oversee and look at what minority-owned businesses, black-owned businesses have been able to do, is with these social unrest problems and challenges we've had, a lot of corporations have come out and made grand announcements of what they're going to do. Right? We're going to spend a billion dollars to address social unrest. We're going to spend five hundred million dollars. Now, these are the same companies who've never done anything in this space, but yet they've made these grand announcements. And what I've challenged 
corporate America is I'm, I'm going to hold you accountable, right? I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to, we're going to come back and review what you've done because I know full well they have no ability to be able to spend anything close to what they say they're going to do. It sounds great, but it's yeah. there, there has to be actions, right? What we're going to judge people off of is what have you done? Don't tell me about your press announcements. Don't what we pledge to do, what we would like to do, what we would endeavor to do. None of that matters, right? What matters is, you know, show me, don't tell me, right? Yeah. Be, like the Missouri, the state of Missouri, show me state. We want to see where it is, and and you guys are doing that. And but you know what's interesting too, and I know, and I'm interested in getting your perspective on this. As you know, you are you are one of only four. African American CEOs of an S and P 500 company, yeah. um, and on one hand, it's a badge of honor, and on another hand, it's a it's a badge of shame for yeah. corporate America um, because we've actually moved backwards from where we were just 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Somehow or another, the commitment to African Americans in the C suite, not just in the CEO position, but in any C-suite position has waned. There's been more of a commitment, frankly, to fill, to making boards. Boards are oftentimes more diverse than the companies that they have responsibility for. Yeah. So we'd love to get your perspective on, and, and certainly you guys have, you know, that's one of the things you've done in all of your stops, frankly, is to make your C-suite be more representative of your customer base. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what you're seeing as this challenge in corporate America that is, is facing. What do you think corporate America has done? And what have you at Lowe's done specifically to address this, this void that we see of black people and brown people sitting in positions of authority and power? You know, but just a, it's, it's a great question. And, and you're right. Uh, for me, you know, am I proud that I'm, I'm in this role. Am, am I proud that, that my dad, as you mentioned at the very beginning, when I was born, was a sharecropper, never graduated from high school, can see one of his children, you know, become the CEO of the 42nd largest company in America. Does that make me proud? Absolutely. It would make any person proud. But also, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not one of the four smartest black executives in America. <laughs> so, so I know there, there's a lot of talent out there that's, that's simply being overlooked because, again, we're looking through the wrong lens. And, and oftentimes, our assessment process when it comes to talent uh, is, is not as thorough and not as complete as it needs to be to identify what we need in a leader in a specific role. And, and, and I've been the victim of that in the past, like many other people have been the victim of that because the, the assessors, when your assessors are not diverse and when the decision makers are not diverse or progressive in how they think about talent, then oftentimes you can be left out. And, and so one of the things I've tried to do at every single stop is to be, be more of a role model on how you select, recruit, and build a diverse team. Because I want to demonstrate, and I've always done this in any company I've worked for, I want to demonstrate to my peer group, if I can find this diverse talent, then why can't you? And then I, then I share with them best practices on things that I'm doing to build diversity. And typically, you know, people want to understand how they can do the same. And, and, and so coming here to Lowe's, you're back in 2018, you know, pre-COVID and pre all this social unrest, it didn't take any of those things for me to quickly determine that I had a problem. You know, of, of all of the officers, officers defined as vice presidents and above for a company with, you know, 300,000 employees, we had less than 10, less than 10. And we had no one in a significant, you know, P&L responsibility. And so again, it didn't take social unrest for me as a CEO to quickly determine we have a problem here. And, and so quietly over the course of time, we now have almost 20 people, you know, black people who are now vice presidents and above in critical roles. My you know, executive vice president of HR, my executive vice president of supply chain, the division president of, of the largest US business, 
the senior vice president over all of our professional sales here you know, in the U.S. Uh, you know, the regional vice president of the largest region, second largest region in sales volume in the United States, and on and on and on. And, and what's interesting, Butch, is these people were available in the marketplace. You know, right. I, I'd love to tell you I'm this great recruiter that can assess talent better than anyone else, but these people were out there. You know, they just were being passed over because the assessment process, as I said, was not as thorough as it needed to be. And, and so what I try to do is, is not just make a decision like this and, and kind of hoard, you know, it for myself. I, I've shared this with numerous CEOs of numerous industries, and we've talked about best practices and in and, and ways you can, you know, leverage certain organizations, certain universities to go out and recruit. And, and the last point that I make, which is, is the way I've always done this, is almost like the analogy of, of a baseball team, a major league baseball team. You got two ways in major league baseball at a high level to build a great team. You can go out and spend a lot of money on free agency. In other words, recruit talent at a high level from other places, or you can build a farm system where you go out early on, you recruit from HBCUs and other universities, and you bring people in at the right level, but then you commit to their development. You commit to their growth, and you help put them on a career track that, that will put them in a position where they can have opportunities in the future. And, and, and the thing that I believe more so than anything and something that my dad taught me is that when someone gives you something, they can take it from you. But when you earn it, it's yours to keep. And, and so I don't believe in giving positions to anyone. I believe in giving individuals the opportunity to earn the right to get promoted or earn the right to take on more responsibility. And, and I think any executive I've ever met that, that, that is really someone that's committed to growth just wants an opportunity to demonstrate what they can do. And that's what we try to do here. No question. Mm -hmm. Now, I was speaking to a, uh, a fellow CEO uh, of a Fortune 500 company, uh, S&P 500 company, if you will. And I was having a from the corner office conversation just like this. Um, and the gentleman who heart was in the right place, wanted to do the right thing, whatever, and he literally said, you know, help me, tell, tell me, what is it that black people want? And he wasn't saying it like you're a fly, like a fly on a, on a shoulder and I'm trying to get you off of it, right? Like, tell me what you want so I can just kind of get you away. Like, tell me what it is, because he said, because I'm, I'm blind to it. And from where he sits, as you can see, and, and yeah. you know, you're surrounded by people who can, who can take you away from getting into the nitty gritty of what's actually happening on the floor, right? With your, your associates. And you are a unique position because you've sort of risen your way all the way up through. So you know what people are doing, but others are blinded by it. And he said, and I said, well, that's an interesting question. What do black people want? I said, what we want is really complicated. And so he kind of looked puzzled and I said, here's what we want. We want jobs, promotions, opportunity, investment in our businesses, and a level playing field. Yeah. So that's it. And he said, that, he said, that's all I want. I said, yeah, it, it, on paper, it sounds very simple. But in practice, it's something else because there's always somebody who stood in the way. You yourself have, have, have experienced it, right? Where you were doing the right things, you were moving yourself along. I would argue you should have been in this position. You know, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I'm, I would argue you could have been in this position 10 years ago, right? Um, we oftentimes, boards, oftentimes when they're doing succession planning, start talking about, well, this is a stretch position, but I think that he can do it. I think this guy can do it. Inevitably, that person they're referring to is not a person who looks like us. Yeah. So we need to make sure that opportunity is afforded. It doesn't mean that the guarantee success. You're not asking to guarantee success. You just want to be guaranteed an opportunity. Absolutely. And I think if we're guaranteed an opportunity, we will succeed. You've been very generous with your time. I want to want to kind of ask you or, or end with asking you to talk a little bit about faith and family and company. It was something that has been very important to you and, and yeah. is, a man, is your personal mantra uh, and how you're making that work because the pressures on a, on a CEO of a 42nd largest company in, in the world with 300,000 employees are enormous. But at the same time, you've got a family that 
wants their father, right? Wants their husband, wants their whatever. And then faith plays a role in this as well, right? Because to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, you didn't get here by yourself. There's a lot of different things that play into it. But love to get your, to kind of end on, explain how you weave faith and family and company to be successful, not just in your personal life, but also for the company as a, as a whole. No, but I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this because it's very important to me. So let's, let's start with, with faith. You know, I, I started out, as, as you mentioned, in a very, you know, low-level hourly position, but I was you know, raised in, in a house, you know, where my six siblings and I were taught a couple of fundamental lessons from our parents. And, and, and the one that, that I'll share is the importance of faith and, and the importance of understanding that we can do nothing here on earth without, you know, God's favor and grace. And so I, I grew up understanding that, and I grew up cultivating those beliefs. And, and as you know, as you get into responsibilities of, 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 of higher levels, the stress level comes along with it. And so over time, you know, I've tried to figure out, you know, how do you navigate, you know, in a very difficult corporate environment with lots of challenges and, and, and maintain, you know, a level of grounding and, and a good foundation of credibility authenticity and, and, and just showing up the right way every day. And, and my faith helps me to do that. And, you know, I, I was on a, a virtual town hall this morning with all of my employees in, in our office in Bangalore, India. And one of the questions someone asked me was, Marvin, how do you deal with the stress of the job in this COVID-19 environment? And I explained to them that a lot of it has to do with my faith. I get up every morning, I get up early between five and five 30 and I go through a morning devotional, you know, Every morning, you know, read scripture, go through my, my prayer, uh, go through my, you know, daily message. And I do that before I look at any, you know, sales reports or any news headlines or any emails, because I want to get, I want to get that foundation established because it helps me to deal with whatever comes at me throughout the day. You know, then I go and I exercise in the morning to try to get that, that physical health, but it also dictates my decision-making. You know, because I'm someone that's, that tries every day to be very consistent, I have a high expectation of people and, and I, you know, challenge people to meet that expectation, but I'm also going to be really fair and really consistent and my faith teaches me to be a good steward of the business and a good steward of people, to be a servant leader, but also make sure that we're doing things the right way. And so my faith grounds me in my decision making. From a family standpoint, I'm very fortunate. My wife, as I say, she's been my girlfriend for 35 years and my wife for 29. So we've been together for a long time. We met in college. Uh, and, 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 and both of us are blessed with two wonderful children, you know, one 24 years old and one soon to be 19. Uh, great children, you know, and, 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 and that is important to me and the most naturally important thing. And I try to, again, be consistent as a father, make sure I'm setting the right example and being a good husband, but also, you know, making sure that, that my wife and I are partners in our decision-making, you know, for the family. And, and again, investing that time. I mean, part, part of what I've done, which I have no hobbies. I mean, when I'm not at work, I'm spending all my time with the family because work is so consuming that if I picked up other hobbies, that would pull me away. And so my life has been about work and about then taking whatever time's left and spending that time with the kids and my wife. Now we're empty nested, but just the family in general and investing that time. And when I'm at home, being at home and making sure that I'm investing the time in the family. And from a business standpoint, it's all about making sure that you understand your role and, your, and, and, and the challenges you take on and that you are prepared. I tell you know, all of my managers, especially the junior managers coming up, that you have a responsibility to be more prepared than the person sitting next to you. And, and you said it. I mean, hard work creates luck. And I tell people all the time, you know, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. If, if, if you can have the opportunity, but if you're not prepared, you're going to be unlucky because it's going to pass you by. And so I'm a big believer in being prepared, uh, doing the work, uh, you know, being intellectually curious and always trying to learn and, and, and trying 
to, to be a good leader and, and a good role model. And, and to me, those things are the ecosystem in which I operate in. And I've been blessed, fortunate in, 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 in all the things that I've done. And I get up every day and I just thank God for the opportunity to serve 300,000 employees and you know, billions of customers and a lot of shareholders. And we've been fortunate that the business is moving in the right direction. And, and, and the team deserves more credit for that than I do. And, and I get up every day very thankful for that. Well, Marvin, I, I appreciate your, your humble thoughts. Um, your, your employees are very fortunate. Shareholders are very fortunate to have you sitting in the position you are in. Uh, you serve as an inspiration, uh, Marvin, not just to young African-American professionals, but to other entrepreneurs and folks like myself. I, I, I admire the success that you've had, but more admire the the person that you are and, and, the, and your commitment and your grounding in faith, your grounding in family, which is always first, as my father always said, he said, listen, look around you. He said, look at your two brothers. Those are your, those are the two best friends you will have in the world. Yeah. And you need to focus on that and put family first and you've done it. And your success is testimony to that. So continue success to you, Marvin. Congratulations on um, continuing to push Lowe's as you have. And we look forward to the great things to come for both you and Lowe's for years to come. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Butch. It was my pleasure. All right. God bless you. God bless you.